Hello everyone and thanks for joining us today for Inspectioneering's The Evolution of Reliability, a live Q&A with Texas Railroad Commissioner Ryan Sitton. My name is Jeremiah Wooten and here with me today is the Railroad Commissioner himself, Commissioner Sitton. Welcome and thank you for taking the time to sit down with us and chat a little bit. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Before we begin, there's a couple of things I want to address first. Um, this is a live Q&A, so all the viewers can feel free to submit any comments or questions you may have into the comment box that is located either next to or below your viewing window. We will have a 10-minute session after the interview where Commissioner Sitton can address them directly. I would also like to take a moment to provide everyone with a little background information on Commissioner Sitton and the Texas Railroad Commission. Now, many of you may not know a whole lot about the Railroad Commission, and some may be surprised to learn that the Railroad Commission, in fact, has absolutely nothing to do with railroads and hasn't for many years. Railroads are actually regulated by the Department of Transportation. The Railroad Commission is the state agency whose primary responsibility is to regulate the exploration, production, and transportation of natural resources in the state of Texas through permitting and reporting requirements, field inspections, and various testing programs the Railroad Commission helps ensure that the oil and gas companies operating in the state of Texas do so in an efficient, safe, and reliable manner. In November of 2014, Ryan Sitton was elected to the Railroad Commission to a six-year term and is the first engineer to hold that position in 50 years. During his time in office, he has worked to make the Commission more efficient and effective so that Texas can lead America to energy independence. Commissioner Sitton has more than 15 years of experience in the oil, gas, and petrochemical industries, and is considered by many as a leading expert in the energy field. In his professional career as a mechanical engineer, he has worked for a number of leading energy companies, and in 2006, he founded Pinnacle Advanced Reliability Technologies, an engineering and technology firm that now employs over 500 people in the state of Texas. Commissioner Sitton, thank you again for joining us. Well, thanks for that introduction, and thanks for clearing up what the Railroad Commission does. That is often confusing to a <laughs> lot of people. Absolutely. It's very confusing. So now, before we begin on the subject of reliability in the oil and gas industry, I wanted to get your opinion on the current state of the energy industry as a whole. Sure. Well, as a lot of people know, Texas energy production has grown substantially over the last eight years. If you look back to 2008, we were producing around a million barrels a day of oil in the state. Today we're producing almost 3.4 million barrels a day. So we've seen huge expansion. Now overall around the globe, we've seen consumption in that same time go from a little under 90 million barrels a day to almost 94 million barrels a day. So we've grown a lot in consumption, but our production has, has gone more or has grown more than that consumption has, and hence we see the decline in pricing. Uh, when you look at what's driving that decline, it, it is the overproduction, and it's driven a lot by that increase in production in the United States. However, you're seeing places like Russia and Saudi Arabia are also producing at near peaks over their history. With all of this decline in pricing, though, I will say that the fundamentals in the oil business look better in the United States than they have looked probably in 50 years. Our ability to develop these onshore shale plays using a combination of horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing is opening up a production environment that just wasn't even feasible just 10 years ago, much less 20 and 30. So we're seeing a, a really, really powerful opportunity in front of us. Now that's the upstream side. The downstream side, the United States continues to be competitive because our refineries See, advantages in terms of their energy prices. Our natural gas in the United States is cheaper than anywhere else. We're running in a more reliable or a higher availability rate than anyone else in the world. So our refineries are exporting a lot of refined products and you're seeing the downstream side of the business still stay very strong. So across the business, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult environment with low oil prices. Overall, long-term energy prices, long-term fundamentals are strong and the downstream business appears to, to have a very long runway in front of it to be very strong. Do you think that your background as an engineer, first and foremost, but your engineering and reliability background uh, provide you with a different perspective of the energy industry than your typical politician? Oh, yes. Uh, you don't see very many geeks in, in politics. <laughs> uh, when we approach any challenge, as, as engineers, we tend to think of ourselves as problem solvers. And right now, the challenge in front of us is not just one of, of regulation for 
drilling an oil well and the well bore integrity or rules around allocation of production. It's also a question of, of activity in the public domain. In other words, if you look at all this growth we've seen in Texas in the last eight years, you'll see a lot of that growth came through communities where new pipelines were constructed or new oil wells went onto people's properties, you know, new surface activity. And that's raised questions, and those aren't political questions. At the end of the day, the average citizen in the state of Texas, and I think, frankly, around the United States, doesn't want to invest the time and energy to understand if the safety programs we have in place or the uh, safety factor that's in this pipeline or the standards that we adhere to in these refineries, they don't want to take the time to try to learn about those to understand that they are substantial, that they are really doing the job. So what they're going to do is they're going to look to state agencies and regulatory agencies to help ensure that. Now, as an industry and someone who's been in it for 15 years, I know the things that we have done and the engineering prowess that the oil and gas companies and and the consultants and the experts have brought to the table, but helping provide a glimpse to that, of that to the average citizen out there is very, very important, and that's where the engineer in me comes into play, helping explain those things in a way that people can have confidence in. Absolutely. So the topic today is obviously reliability. Mm -hmm. How do you define reliability, and how important do you feel reliability is to the growth and advancement of the energy industry in Texas? Well. It's a great question because reliability does get a lot of different definitions mm -hmm. out there. But at the end of the day, in our space, reliability basically means the ability of an asset to do its job when we want it to do its job or when we expect it to do its job. We know that not every asset is going to last forever, and that's okay as long as we can plan around its life and we know what to expect from it, then it can be a reliable asset. This has become vital to our business, and I don't, when I say our business, whether your exploration and production, your midstream pipeline operations, your refining, petrochemical operations, the name of the game in a commodity business is can I operate reliably? I can't control the price of the feedstock that I buy, and I can't control the price of the end product that I sell to the consumer. All I can affect is what I do in the middle. And as an operator, one of the basic levers I can pull is operate more reliably. When I want this facility to be operating, that it does and it responds and it produces on the pace and on the schedule that it should. If you look at how the U.S., for example, U.S. refining regime competes around the world, our availability or the use of our refineries is higher than everybody else's. We're running, depending on who you talk to, somewhere in the low 90s, 92, 93 percent of our refining capacity is online. You look at places like Europe and other, other areas around the globe, sometimes they're as low as 70%. That reliability is where our industries in the United States are leading the pack. Generally speaking, do you believe energy companies, regulatory bodies, and other politicians are giving reliability the attention it deserves? Well, I think that, that energy companies, absolutely. You, if you talk to anybody, whether they're a small independent producer or an independent refiner or a major integrated oil company, Everyone knows that reliability of operation is crucial to not just surviving and being profitable, but to running a sustainable operation. Mm -hmm. When you have unforeseen downtime, when you have, heaven forbid, safety incidents, they're not just unprofitable. They mean it's very difficult to, to operate your business. So everyone has that as a top priority. Now, when you get to the regulatory side, we take a little different approach. The regulators tend to not focus on the profitability side of reliability because that's, that's not their job. They focus on the safety and the community or environmental impacts. And that's where they do take reliability very seriously. And I think when you look beyond that to general industry and the consumer, at the end of the day, how important is reliability to a consumer? Well, they may not think of reliability in a refinery, but by golly, if they are experiencing brownouts or power is down because a power plant is not operating, reliability is, is not just important, it's expected. It's a quality of life issue. So I think a lot of people are aware of it, even though they may use different verbs, different words to talk about it. Commissioner Sitton, in your opinion, how valuable are organizations like the American Petroleum Institute or the American Society of Mechanical Engineers to the improved safety and reliability of the equipment utilized in oil and gas operations? Well, they're vital. And the reason I say that is, at the end of the day, the oil companies have to be very careful when they talk about their best practices because there's, there's expectations of them to compete in a free market environment. And institutions like the American Petroleum Institute or American Society of Mechanical Engineers, uh, 
you know, Texas Alliance of Energy Producers, Texoga, which are Texas-based organizations, they allow the operators forums to share best practices because at the end of the day, it's good for our state, it's good for our nation, it's good for the consumer, and it's good for the oil company for us to be safe and reliable. That benefits everybody. So as they can share those lessons learned through those forums and establish best practices and codes and standards, that becomes vital to that company's ability, particularly the smaller companies, to advance their performance by understanding what those best practices look like. Now, the oil and gas industry tends to address mechanical integrity and safety apart from reliability. Mm -hmm. However, many companies have seen success when they look at these two types of practices as complementary rather than mutually exclusive. In your experience as a successful business owner and now as the Texas Railroad Commissioner, what are some of the things companies should be doing to improve the overall reliability of their assets? What a, what a great question. And you're, you're speaking to the evolution as we talk about the mm -hmm. topic. It really is about the evolution of how we look at these problems. Let's go back in history a little bit. When you looked at, at the PSM standard that rolled out in the early 90s and how that was a step change in expectation of people inside refineries and chemical plants for, uh, for mechanical integrity. Oh yes, we have to have a defined mechanical integrity program and we're going to adhere to recognized and generally accepted good engineering practice or RAGAGEP. And so very quickly you saw the industry take a step change. And what's cool is some of the people that drove some of those changes are still around the industry today. There's some of the expert consultants that we still see advising some of the big uh, oil and gas advances. What happened over the, 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 the 90s and then into the, into the 2000s is that software programs and computers allowed us to do very large scale analyses much more quickly than we could in the past. In the early 90s and, and late 80s, people were doing a thickness calculation and remaining life calculation by hand. All of a sudden, computers could do it on the fly when you just entered a new thickness measurement. Well then, with, with newer and newer technology and more advanced modeling, we're able to look at facilities more holistically. So instead of looking at just one asset, one pressure vessel or one piece of pipe, we can look at the entire system. Sometimes that system may include thousands of assets. And to understand the reliability of the whole system, you have to treat all of those assets as one group. But you can only really do that with fairly complex modeling and fairly rapid calculations with, which computers offer us. So now what we're seeing is, we've talked in the mechanical integrity space with risk-based inspection for a long time about focusing our resources on the areas that present the highest risk. Well, the next evolution is looking holistically at the facility or at a unit or at a system and saying, let me think beyond just putting those resources to the most valuable inspections, but should those resources go to upgrades? Or should they go to uh, modifications? Or should they go to different operating parameters? Should they go to monitoring? Or should we say in certain assets, we shouldn't monitor them at all. We should let them run to failure because the odds of that failure and the consequences or the risk is so low compared to the other assets in the system that there's practically no value gained in monitoring those assets. But only with this more and more advanced integrated approach at looking at all these different assets, not discreetly, but together, can we get that holistic picture? And that is the future. And you'll see that coming into, into the, the mainstream today, and I think over the next 10 years, your leading companies will all be doing that. They'll all be looking at these things holistically, and they'll be planning their inspection activities, their upgrades, their turnaround efforts, and their modifications and operating parameters all in the same, in the same discussion, in the same plan. So the evolution over the past 10 years, we've discussed the evolution over the next 10 years is this holistic approach where it's all the equipment's integrated. And so that's really the major fundamental changes you're seeing in reliability in the future that you anticipate? I think so, and, and I'll speak to that a little bit more. When you think about things like PHAs, HAZOPs, we have been doing those, performing those as an industry every five years on every process unit since the PSM standard some, some even before that, but certainly when the PSM standard came into place. And what you'll hear from some of our operators is, well, you know, the first couple of PHAs, the first couple of HAZOPs, we got good ideas and good recommendations. But in the last 25, 30 years, we've, we've gotten pretty good at operating these facilities. And the last couple of rounds of HAZOPs or, or PHAs have been, um, the recommendations haven't been as fruitful. In fact, we're seeing a lot of the same recommendations. And what we need to do is empower that group. You're getting a lot of very valuable resources from that operating facility together in one room and asking them to do a deep dive on this unit. 
well, why not give them the modeling tools and allow them to really, to really delve into the different reliability impacts? Because reliability, as we said, touches safety, touches profit, touches maintainability, um, you know, cost of operation, personnel utilization. So when we look at all those things holistically, I can take that one area up tremendously in terms of how, it, how the PHA is leveraged within my facility. And you'll see lots of other areas, safety systems analysis, that, that all are touched by our ability to look at reliability holistically. So based on your experience, what does the long-term future, let's say 50 years from now, hold for reliability within the energy industry? You know, I'll, I'll paint a picture of, of what I think that looks like. Let's say you were to, you know, 50 years from now, you're dropped in the middle of a, of a really complex oil field or a refinery of the future. And I think what you'll find is, because we'll all be carrying mobile devices then, right? The, little, the desktop things will be some sort of antique that, we, that our kids joke about us old guys using. And you'll be able to see real time what, what data that is coming into your, your system tells you about the reliability of your, of your system. So for example, oh yes, the temperature on this compressor has gone up five degrees in the last week. Or a, an inspector just went out and, and, and took a thickness measurement on a piece of pipe coming out of the, the top of this crude column. Or uh, we see some vibration readings off of this pump and this, this bearing. And instantly, that, is, that, that looks at not just that one asset, but the entire system. And it tells you what the reliability of that, of that system is going to do now, how it gets changed by that little piece of data. And when it changes, the business unit leaders, plant manager or the, the, the production unit manager for a, a, an exploration production field, they're going to look at that data and say, how do I affect my business practices based on what these discrete pieces of data tell me about the reliability of this system? And you can imagine, these pieces of data are not just going to come in one a day, they're coming in thousands a day, but they're all coming in automated into this one system. And now I can say, wow, I'm going to need to move my turnaround date ahead, or I've got the ability to push that turnaround date out, and I can make that decision somewhat on the fly. I'll be able to say, wow, I'm going to change my inspection regime for next year based on the reliability because it looks like instead I'm going to need to go to an upgrade strategy based on crude slates that we're running. And to be able to make those decisions on the fly will not only mean, yes, we've gotten more reliable and we run our facilities a higher degree of availability, you'll see the companies implementing those things taking real step changes beyond their competition. And it, it will, it will cause a, another, I think, shift in terms of the economics around the entire oil and gas industry. Well, at this time, Commissioner Sitton, I think we should go ahead and take a look at some of the viewer questions that have been submitted. Uh, John uh, submitted a question. He says, if the Railroad Commission is no longer handling railroads, <laughs> why haven't they changed their name? Well, John, thank you very much for asking that question. It has been something that uh, I will tell you historically, I. I always had a, a lot of uh, pride in the name Texas Railroad Commission. There's a lot of tradition there. And if you go back to the early 1900s, from 19, 1920s until 1970, the Texas Railroad Commission controlled global oil prices because the Railroad Commission set allowable levels in the state of Texas. But if you look at more recent history, the fact is not very many people in the state know what the Railroad Commission does, and I think that's a miss. And I think that we absolutely need to change the name. Uh, this last legislative session, so just over the last few months, a legislator, a guy named um, Larry Sherman, Larry, sorry, um, what is his name, Dag Nabbit? Larry from up in the Sherman area, Larry Phillips, thank you, Larry Phillips up in Sherman area, uh, he submitted a bill that was going to be a constitutional amendment to change the name of the Railroad Commission to the Texas Energy Commission. I was a strong supporter of that bill, but we couldn't get it through the House. Uh, it got out of committee and was going to calendars, but it came out too late in session and didn't make the House floor. So I'm hopeful, uh, John, uh, that hopefully in the next legislative session in Texas, which is going to come up um, in another year and a half, that we'll be able to get that done, because I think it'd be great for Texas to do that. It, it is confusing. Yeah. I didn't, I mean, I, I actually uh, have spent quite a bit of time, my whole career in the oil and gas industry, and it wasn't until later in college that I even realized the Railroad Commission in Texas was uh, responsible for oil and gas, so mm -hmm. it is confusing. It's time for a change there. Um, question here from Tim is really going from from the private sector to um, you know to to the government here to the railroad commission. How do you make that transition? What mm -hmm. is the day in the life of the railroad commissioner, and how was that transition from 
you know, being a being a business person. Yeah, great. Well, in fact, just before we started this this uh, webinar today, we were talking and visiting about this exact same thing, and I was sharing that one thing that's really interesting about serving as a railroad commissioner that's very different from the private sector is in the private sector you can be very inwardly focused, right? You can worry about your business and about your profits and your employees and your customers. And so every time you're having a discussion, you're focused on a very small niche, which is the issues you're talking about and the customers that have concerns about what you deal with. When you're in public office, the, the landscape broadens quite a bit. Now I'm a railroad commissioner, which means my, my sole focus is still energy. However, there's days where I'm gonna go talk to an oil and gas company about potential changes to regulation, and I wanna get input from them on how those changes leverage new technology. Then I might go speak to a group of political activists that aren't necessarily in the oil business. And they've got an entirely different set of questions about how the things that we're doing at the Railroad Commission affect their lives and the pipelines and infrastructure in their neighborhood. And then you go meet with, with people that um, are, are putting together events to try and educate or communicate to large groups of people. And okay, how do we, how do we communicate with those people? What are the issues that they're concerned about? They're not maybe political activists, but they're still citizens that want to know what is even going on? Why, do, why is the name the Texas Railroad Commission and not something else? So you're, you're, you switch, you, you put different hats on depending on what, what your bosses want you to talk about. At the end of the day, my boss or my bosses are the 27 million Texans who vote for Texas Railroad Commissioner. So we, we shift very quickly. But I will tell you one thing that's very similar is at the end of the day, people really do want to know when they look at an issue or a, a challenge that's faced in the oil and gas industry, people are going to want to know are the things we're doing safe? Are the principles that we use, the practices we use, are they sufficient? And so to, to a lot, I'll find myself channeling some of the experiences from the private sector when I go in and talk to people now in, in the public domain about what we're doing and talking about safety factors and talking about best practice and ASME codes and standards and API best practices. So a lot of that, a lot of that information is amazingly useful, uh, even though you may think, well, what's a, what's a bunch of geeky engineering stuff have to do with the common citizen, but it applies. So you've been in office eight months now? Over Close eight to months. It. Yep. So can you tell us about some of the energy initiatives that you've worked on since you began your term? Yeah, great question, and, and I'll put the Railroad Commission job into a couple of buckets. One is the, the, the running the agency, right? We have to make sure that we've got 800 people that work at the Railroad Commission, and it's a, it's a really impressive staff. They, they're, they're sharp, they're devoted. Uh, virtually every, every Railroad Commission staffer that I have had a chance to work with has been very committed to doing what's going to serve the state and the industry over the long haul because it's important to our state that the oil and gas industry thrive. The other bucket, separate from running the agency, are broader initiatives. Now, I'll tell you one that is pretty vital. In the history of the state of Texas, we've never had a state energy plan. Now, people will say, well, what's a state energy plan? If a company or an individual or an entity has capital to invest, you know, a big company has $2 billion to invest in new oil and gas projects, where are they going to choose to make that investment? They're going to make that investment in places where they can feel confident that the infrastructure and the market is going to give them a return on that investment. As a regulatory agency and as a state elected official, we have the purview to document what we think that's going to look like. If Texas continues to increase its oil production, its natural gas production, same for the rest of the United States, if we continue to ramp up and increase our production, where are the opportunities? to export some of our light, sweet, crude products and to construct the pipelines to get those products to market, whether it be other parts of the country or exported. Where is, where are refineries going to be needed to supply more refined products to communities and to neighborhoods? So as we articulate where we think that's going to go, we give people confidence to invest and make sure that we continue to build our energy infrastructure, which I believe is going to be vital to this country and this state for decades, uh, for generations. One of our viewers asks, what advice can you give to someone looking to start their career in the inspection or mechanical integrity field? Well, I will tell you, it's a fantastic field. And that, that probably sounds a little bit, well, of course you're going to say that, Ryan. That's what you built your business in. But, you know, I graduated from high school. My parents were both teachers, didn't have a lot of, didn't have a lot of money. I've actually put myself through school at a and I was pretty proud of that. Uh, but 
but getting out now and starting this business and have been very blessed. Our, our business has grown like crazy and, and give credit to Inspectioneering has helped us with, with getting that message out. I say us, I'm not the CEO there anymore. Uh, I still talk that way sometimes, but, but certainly that business benefited and I benefited from that. And, I, and that was, I'd like to think it's because I'm really sharp, but I also know it's because there was a lot of need for those types of services and people who are willing to go into that space and innovate and who are committed, how do I help this facility, how do I help this customer, how do I help make sure this asset is not only going to have mechanical integrity, but be reliable to operate? How quickly can I learn, not just about taking thickness measurements or what a shear wave inspection report looks like, but what does this mean in terms of the operation of a FCC or a um, crude unit? You know, what does it mean in terms of the operation of this refinery? The more you can learn quickly, the more you can absorb what this business looks like and how reliability fits into the overall picture, you'll have a tremendous career, tremendous opportunity. One thing I'll, I'll hit on, yesterday I was up in, uh, I was up at a meeting I, I mentioned earlier that was, um, it was a group from the IPAA, it was their Education Advisory Council. And this was a group of people that represent the independent producers saying, what do we need to do to advance the education of the next group of oil field workers? And their data tells them that over the next 10 years, 50% of the people in the oil and gas industry are going to retire. That is a massive amount of job opportunity. And these are well-paying jobs. So as people come into the industry and evaluate where's my niche, where's my opportunity, they're going to be everywhere. And if you find your passion in reliability, mechanical integrity, there's going to be a ton of opportunity there. It's all about how quickly you can learn and how committed you can be to really understanding the holistic picture of reliability. So Ray has submitted a question. It says, uh, will the Railroad Commission ever allow RBI to set boiler intervals? Int say the uh, great question, but Ray, the, the, the Railroad Commission doesn't actually control boiler inter intervals. That is the state boiler inspector. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a great question. In fact, something when I was in the private sector, I used to talk about all the time. Uh, where, you know, where do we see this thing going? How well is, is um, our boiler, how well will the state boiler inspector utilize uh, RBI and his inspection requirements, and he doesn't work for the Railroad Commission. So I don't have any control over that, but certainly would like to see it done too, because I believe that that approach, that methodology, is, it, it is not only the future, it is best practice, and it's the way we ought to do business. Well, that actually concludes our interview today. Those are all the questions submitted by the viewers. On behalf of myself and the rest of the guys from Inspectioneering, I would like to once again thank Commissioner Sitton for joining us today. It was a privilege to talk with you about this important issue. And thank you to the viewers for tuning in. If you liked today's interview, feel free to let us know. And be sure to share with any colleagues you think would find it interesting. A video replay will be available in the next couple of days on inspectioneering.com. Take care, everyone. Stay safe out there.